Well, so glad you're with us live and we can answer some questions here. But before our first question, I just want to say, um, just to remind you all of two things. Uh, if you dropped in late, uh, you can write in questions in the Q&A and use that button down center of your screen. And, uh, and also in, uh, the email address for prayer requests. Uh, the prayer team is right there because I realize uh, certain things have come up in your mind or your soul and you would just might love some prayer as we continue on or later you can write them after uh, we close off the seminar and you can get prayer um, be, before to give people some time to write in some questions why don't you tell us about what is the hope and healing center and institute and what what does it do what is its vision yeah, the Hope and Healing Center and Institute uh, was started and sits on the campus of St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Houston, Texas. We are a separate 501c3 from the church. We've existed since 2011. Uh, it is a what we are now. They provide a building for us uh, on campus. We're a, a fully uh, comprehensive mental health clinic for people with serious mental illness. Uh, uh, and we uh, also do a lot of outreach to the community in the context of educational seminars. Uh, we do a lot of research in relationship to um, how to engage people through faith communities uh, that are have mental health problems. And then we have a, what we call the Gateway to Hope program where we go into faith communities and we train them uh, to be involved in mental health care, how to recognize mental health care issues, how to make referrals, how to set up restorative programs like support groups or mental health coaching uh, right in the church so people can access care at some level for free. Uh, and we now have a network in the Houston area of a little bit over 100 churches where we have those services available. Uh, and that's all based on the fact that people are more likely to go to a clergy or a church before they go to a mental health care provider or a physician when they're struggling with mental health problems. So uh, we're very dedicated to uh, equipping the church to be more involved in the care of those who are struggling with mental health problems. Yeah, that is amazing. I think at one time you said like 80% of the people will go to the pastor first. Uh, before going to a therapist. I think you said that in the previous seminar, uh, which is amazing. And, and hopefully uh, Dr. Sanford will be back next March and uh, again, continue training um, our churches of how to be more effective on the front line of, of helping people with their, with their issues. And, and you really have a heart to, I thought at one time you had said it's, it's like free therapy for anybody who needs it. And then of course you refer them to others. Is that still? Uh, yeah, all of our services, all of our services are free. So we provide all of our therapeutic services for free as well as psychiatric services, medication. We pay for medication because uh, finances are a huge barrier to people accessing care. Uh, and the services that are offered through the faith communities that, that we work with uh, and the training that we offer is evidence-based and it does reduce symptoms and it certainly can be offered for free through those faith communities. That's just amazing. Uh, someday I would love to have that kind of center and institute here in Hawaii. I know you have to raise millions of dollars literally to make that happen, but wouldn't that be great if we could have a, a Christian center institute that just provides free uh, help and mental health. That would be amazing. So Hey, I'm all for it. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'll get my plane ticket. We're on our way. <laughs> all right. So if anybody has a checkbook, you can bring it out now and we'll, we'll make that happen. We just need a four or five million or so. Sure. That's so easy. let's start. Oh, go ahead. Um, let's start uh, with the questions now. Some are uh, rolling in now. And, um, you know, you had mentioned earlier that uh, women, um, twice as common as men to have PTSD. Why, mm -hmm. why is that? You know, that's a that's an oft asked question. And there's there there are some answers that they think may be the answer, but it, it's not really exactly clear. Uh, some have suggested that, you know, for the fact that women are more prone to depression, that there could be some link there uh, because PTSD and depression go hand in hand. Uh, another argument, which I think is probably a little bit uh, better of an argument, is that the fact that women are actually more likely to be traumatized than men. Uh, there's a greater number of opportunities for them to be traumatized, particularly in the context of things like domestic mm. violence and rape. It isn't to say that those things don't happen in men, but they don't happen at nearly the rate that they happen in women. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, trauma experiences that occur to women that really don't occur to men at very high rates. And that may be driving some of the difference that we see. Okay, great. Uh, that makes sense now when you put it in that context. And uh, for this next question, I just want to, again, affirm our community out there. I know some of these questions are very uh, tender, and I, I appreciate your vulnerability and, and transparency and, and a desire to get some answers. And, and the next question is from, from one of our viewers is, uh, can a two-year-old child who observed domestic violence, uh, beating of the mother, uh, can that child experience PTSD? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, children can certainly, of any age, a child of any age, uh, exposed to particularly what you would think of as repetitive trauma or chronic trauma, uh, can be damaged by that. If a two-year-old child saw a mother be um, assaulted one time, uh, the likelihood is that that is not going to cause uh, any kind of significant damage to the child over time. Uh, if that was a common occurrence and the child was witnessing that, certainly could be damaging to the child uh, you know, from a trauma perspective, particularly in the context of later expressions of violence and their ability to attach to, uh, to loved ones. And, and can that have long-term uh, effect? Another uh, viewer has uh, written in that, um, she says, my sister recently experienced a stroke and has reverted back to a childlike way of talking. Mm -hmm. uh, could PTSD play a part in this? Our father was emotionally abusive. And uh, so she's asking if that's right. true, but how can I help my sister recover from possible PTSD? It's unlikely that it, it I would say this, it's unlikely that her, her regression uh, to more a childlike state is caused by PTSD, although she certainly could have been struggling with PTSD before. Uh, with a stroke, it's not uncommon, depending on where the stroke occurs, uh, in the brain that an individual would have some regression maybe in their intellect or in their behavior. You can get significant personality change with the stroke. Uh, so really what I would suggest that you do is focus more on the stroke at this point. Uh, work with a neurologist to see uh, in the context of getting some, that there is some cognitive therapies that can uh, help a person regain some of that. Uh, sometimes some of that um, is not able to be regained just because the damage is significant. Uh, I would say that while it certainly is a, a very much a negative uh, that, uh, that your sister may be in more of a childlike state, uh, what happens with a stroke is it allows, it, it, it allows things that we kind of hold in to now be disinhibited and we can't control them well. So your sister probably was a wonderful, loving, caring person and now she behaves in more of a childlike state. And un sometimes, unfortunately, when people were kind of angry and mean and, and not the nicest people, what happens with their stroke is they begin to behave in a very negative and aggressive way. And, and so really what you're seeing is just the expression of kind of the core of your sister's personality, which is just a wonderful childlike state. Uh, but at some cognitive therapies with a neurologist might be very helpful to help her gain some of control over that. Um, related, another child-related uh, question is, um, what are the long-term effects of PTSD cognitive problems, and, and can it affect younger young children heading back to school during a pandemic? Um, mm -hmm. And oh, no, absolutely. Because we're uh, here in our state, we're opening up, uh, I forget when, in a week or two. And so big, very much on the conscience of our, of our people here. No, absolutely. And that is going to be a significant problem. So the cognitive effects related to PTSD, uh, particularly in children, are going to be uh, memory problems, uh, lack of attention, uh, inability to focus attention. Uh, you're going to see irritability, uh, kind of... Uh, just kind of an expression of anxiety, kind of an ear where they're just kind of agitated all the time and easily kind of go off. Uh, and so as a child goes back into a, a situation where, uh, you know, just think about what's going to happen. They're going to go into a classroom that's spaced apart. Everybody's wearing masks. They're not going to be able to leave the rooms for lunch. That's what they're doing here uh, in Texas. They're going to eat lunch in the same room. Uh, it, it's going to be a constant you know, all day long exposure of be careful, you're going to get sick, be careful, you're going to get sick, be careful, you're going to get sick. And that's going to be an absolutely impossible environment to learn. in. I mean, I'm, I'm just there, you know, I was just given a talk yesterday. Uh, and virtually, I, I've read a number of, of uh, you know, kind of plans for schools going back from all over the country, because I get asked about it all the time. They are not functional. Uh, these children will not be able to learn effectively. Uh, we're putting them into a frightening situation and they are not going to be able to learn effectively. So what I would say is you can't control what happens at school, but you can't control what happens at your house. Make your house a safe place. Uh, give your ch child a chance to kind of decompress when they come home. Maybe even help them with some relaxation techniques. Make sure they're eating right. Make sure they're getting some exercise. Uh, and, uh, you know, give them a chance to talk to you about how they're feeling. Uh, and they'll do better than those who don't have that situation to go home to a safe haven. You know, my heart goes out to our teachers, our administrators. I mean, they're between a rock and a hard place, Absolutely. right? They're mandated to go back. But then I also, my heart goes out to parents because 
um, especially if they're single parents or maybe they're not single parents. And, uh, you know, if, if they have to go to work and right. the kids aren't going back to school, they can't afford uh, childcare, you know, five days a week. And then financially, double whammy, maybe, you know, right. how does that happen? And there is no perfect answer. Yeah, it's a, it is a real mess. I mean, it's a real mess. You, you think there's going to be actually more PTSD after COVID? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, or during we're, COVID also, you know, I should we're, say. I think, I think as we, we will see the greater effect of this as people are, are have to take on greater responsibility and move back into work and move back into school. We're going to see that we've had a tremendous mental health fallout here. Uh, and what all the hospitals are predicting is the mental health fallout from this is years long, uh, whereas the mm -hmm. virus itself would mm -hmm. just, you know, is, is hopefully, hopefully we'll have it under control next year if we can get a vaccine. Uh, you could be looking for two to three years worth of mental health uh, fallout from this uh, that can be just as detrimental to the economy. Well, and it's even more important when we get to the fourth talk and, and much of your, tra your training us here in Hawaii, I appreciate this is like your third time with us, um, that um, uh, we, those on the front lines, churches, for example, we need to be equipped more to, to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And, and, and it sounds like also, I wish you could speak to a lot of our teachers and DOE administrators and maybe say, hey, you know, here's some equipping tools because the kids will be uh, traumatized and they will have memory issues and, and maybe give them some slack in, in learning. Is that what you're saying and, and how they're going to be taking information in? Absolutely. And we are actually going to be doing some, we're moving our Gateway to Hope training into schools uh, this fall. So we are going to be doing some online training and I, I can get you all that information. You can get it out to oh, that would be great. Uh, Hawaii is where. So no, but absolutely. I think we have to, we have to step back and we have to say, what is the environment here? Uh, our children's mental health is more important than uh, their education at the moment. It doesn't mean we can't educate them, but we just have to be careful uh, that we don't double stress them here. Mm -hmm. Um, one question is, uh, you, you, I, um, this person heard you say a phrase, lifetime prevalence, in mm -hmm. relation to 17% of U.S. experiencing, uh, US experiencing depression and PTSD in 7% of population. Right. Um, wh what does that mean, lifetime prevalence? Lifetime prevalence means that, that like, for instance, PTSD, 7% of the U.S. population in a given lifetime will experience PTSD. So normally what you see with prevalence rates is you either see a lifetime prevalence rate or an annual prevalence rate. An annual prevalence, prevalence rate, excuse me, is the, num the percentage of people in a given year that will have a disorder. Typically that number is higher than the lifetime prevalence rate. And I tend to go with a lifetime prevalence rate because it gives you an idea of how likely it is that you would experience that over a given lifetime. And so with depression, for instance, it's 17% of the population. It's one of the most common mental health problems. So, you know, a very large portion of the population will struggle with depression in a given lifetime. Are, are some people, somebody's asking, more prone to PTSD than others? I don't know if that means genetically. No, that is or true. There, there absolutely are. I mean, in fact, the studies that have been done uh, have been uh, most often with police officers and firemen uh, because uh, you know that they are going to have higher rates of PTSD because they're exposed to significant trauma. So they are tested when they first go to the fire academy or the police academy. And then unfortunately, you have to, you kind of wait until they're exposed. And you do find that they have, their, their brains tend to be a little bit more reactive. Uh, the individuals who get uh, PTSD a little bit more reactive to uh, threatening stimuli or, or threatening situations. Uh, it's no guarantee. It's not like, you know, I can't look at a person and say that person's going to get it. Uh, but I know the military uh, spends an enormous amount of money every year uh, on trying to figure out who is more likely to get PTSD versus who isn't. Uh, you know, I would say this, if you're, if you have a loved one or you're a kind of individual that's very reactive to stimuli, uh, you know, loud noises really affect you or pe people talking too much, or you're kind of overwhelmed by sensory stimuli, that type of individual is, is more sensitive to the environment and would be more likely uh, to get PTSD, although it's not a guarantee. I didn't know the military was spending a lot of money in research. Oh, I mean, that's enormous. brilliant. Yeah, I mean, millions and millions of dollars. Preventive medicine, right? Don't put no, this absolutely. person on the front lines. Maybe this person could be highly effective on the back No, that's exactly right. Working you're, you're on intelligence or something. You want to oh. know, uh, know who's more likely to get it because once a person gets it, 
they're going to have it, you know, they're going to, it's going to require years of treatment. Uh, you would rather know that this person would be better right in the, you know, behind the lines and on the lines. Uh, and, and they spend, it is an enormous amount of money, enormous. Hmm. Well, we have a number of very um, practical questions from our, our people. Uh, one person said, um, what do you recommend for someone who faced PTSD as a result of childbirth, but desires to have another child? How do you work through that? Right. Well, trauma, you know, trauma of any type. And you certainly could have a horrible uh, childbirthing experience. You could have a terminal illness, you could have all kinds of things that could give you PTSD. It wouldn't necessarily be, you know, like an earthquake or a tsunami or something. But, um, you know, what you have to do is you have to process the, the trauma. Until the trauma is processed, it's not possible for you to move mm. beyond it. So you have mm. to go and work with a trauma therapist and process the trauma, and then you move beyond it. And you're, you'll be able to take control of your body and take control of your thoughts uh, because you are stuck in the trauma uh, and you can't just think your way out of it by yourself. So processing the trauma is what is necessary. And uh, you need to just find a, a, a individual, a, a therapist who is experienced with trauma or exposure therapy, uh, and they can process it with you. It's a highly effective therapy. Uh, and within a span of, uh, you know, six months to a year, uh, you should be able to move beyond that trauma and, and begin to live beyond it. Hmm. So that's good. Um, that, I mean, this is so helpful. Uh, for some people say, I'll deal with that later, or I don't need to deal with that. But you're saying you're just avoiding the healing that has to take place. You've got to face that trauma. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And you, you are stuck in the trauma unless you process it and allow that healing. Uh, you're never going to be able to move beyond it. And you, what you keep doing, as you just said, is you keep stuffing it down and stuffing it down and saying, I'll just deal with that later. And whether you consciously realize it or not, it's it, is, it is affecting every relationship you have and all the thoughts that you're having. So one person's asking, you know, on average, how long can PTSD symptoms last? Let's say you are working on it, but... Uh... Well, if you have PTSD and you get no treatment, they'll last forever. Uh, or okay. until you die. I mean, because, you know, if, if you have a higher rate of stroke and things like that, I mean, you, you don't want to, you know, die at an earlier age. Uh, certainly over time, they might plateau and you might be able to function minimally, uh, but uh, they might not be as much of a problem. But really, at that point, it's just because your, your life has gotten to a point where your dysfunction has defined where you can be. Uh, so you absolutely have to work on them. Uh, what, what I find is that people, you know, so if someone has PTSD and maybe it's affecting their job more than it's affecting, uh, say, you know, maybe their relationships. And so their job is minimized away and they tend to be home more. Uh, and over time, they become kind of comfortable with this existence. Uh, and they say, okay, well, I'm doing better now. See, I'm good. When in reality, they're not able to live out a full life. And so I think that's the thing you need to ask yourself. Are you able to do everything that you would want to do uh, or could do. Uh, and if you can't, then, you know, you certainly need to move on. There's, don't be afraid of treatment. I would be more fearful of living with PTSD symptoms forever than I would be for dedicating myself to six months or a year of treatment. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of the question that if you do have treatment, is it average six months to a year to work it through or? I mean, I, it depends on the trauma and the intensity yeah. of the situation. Right. Uh, but I think that in most instances, you know, I mean, it really just depends. I mean, some people have very complex trauma uh, that is, uh, you know, it's very chronic, ex you know, traumatic experiences or multiple traumas. And that can certainly take longer. Uh, but for, you know, in, in this instance, we're talking about a single traumatic exposure. If we're talking about COVID or something like that. Uh, it really shouldn't take that long to be able to make some significant progress. And, you know, back to that question about, you know, if you just have PTSD, how long will it last? I, I like to kind of think about if it is this example, if you broke your leg, okay, and you didn't go to the doctor, it wouldn't heal right, okay, but you might still be able to walk, but you couldn't do everything that you used to do because you didn't really get it fixed. But then over time, you just kind of be satisfied with what you could do. It's the same thing with a mental health problem. You know, why stumble around on a broken brain when you could get it fixed and move forward? That makes sense. And, um, and so if something happened earlier, like in, in your 20s, and maybe there was drug use or abuse or something like that, it, it can crop up 10 or 20 years later if you haven't dealt with it. Is that what you're Absolutely. In fact, it's been, it's been cropping up the whole time. You just didn't really realize that's what it was. I mean, so let's say a woman is involved in a, a you know, or has an abusive father, a father that abuses her 
uh, physically. Uh, and then she leaves the home and goes to college. And now uh, you know, she's never dealt with that. She thinks, oh, I'm good now. I'm out of that. You know, uh, Well, that trauma is likely to affect every male relationship she ever has from then on. Uh, whether she recognizes that or not. That's something that has to be dealt with. Uh, we're really good, you know, you know, in the U.S. about, you know, especially in the West, just generally kind of pushing our feelings down and acting like, well, we just got to move on. Uh, don't let the past affect you. Well, the reality is a past affects you every day, and there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes it's very good that it affects you, uh, but you do have to deal with those traumatic experiences. Here's a... Um... The next one, and uh, boy, there's so many questions. I really appreciate how you just, or you're so concise, but this one is um, a bit more complicated. There, uh, someone has a 30-year-old son uh, diagnosed with PTSD from sexual abuse uh, from a football team in a certain place and uh, while in college, uh, which eventually led, according to the medical people at that point, to paranoia schizophrenia. And uh, some say it's medical, some say he's demonically possessed. Uh, the bottom line is the family feels no one has been able to help. He's in jail for violence to the public. He's homeless, he has substance abuse. Um, and uh, this has at least been 12 years of a pattern. So the, the, these uh, parents or parent is asking, what should the priority be? We're told meds, we're told neurologists, we're told housing therapy. Um, of course, there's a satanic thought. Um, he's coming out on uh, the 28th of maybe this month. So they're asking, what is the priority? They don't just don't know where to start. Right. Well, obviously, it's a very complex situation. Uh, you know, yes. it's, it, PTSD doesn't really cause schizophrenia, but what it's likely had that occurred is that this this young man. Uh, was already predisposed for schizophrenia, and the trauma was a predis was a factor that caused it to kind of ultimately manifest itself. So he's probably struggling with post traumatic stress issues in addition to a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of our mentally ill uh, find themselves in the criminal justice system. There's ten times more mentally ill people in prisons and jails than there are in hospitals. So that unfortunately is not uncommon. Uh, and so you know what I would say is you have to look at what are his what are his problem symptoms that are the biggest problem for him to be able to function uh, because you have to you know for for uh for trauma therapy you have to be able, have to be able to sit down with a therapist and work through the trauma but if he's delusional for instance if he thinks he's a famous person or he's having hallucinations it it doesn't matter whether he has trauma or not you have to manage those symptoms first so what are his biggest symptoms that are affecting him the greatest in his ability to function day to day. And as those are taken care of, and most likely those are going to be his schizophrenia symptoms. The other thing is with an individual that's struggling with such complex uh, uh, situation, it might not be an idea to see if he could go into some long-term residential care where he could be stabilized. Most psychiatric care is acute care. It just is a few weeks. Uh, you, you see if you could get him into a facility for, you know, maybe six months to a year, uh, where, you know, which unfortunately is going to be extremely expensive because most of those places don't take insurance, but then allow, it would allow him to be stabilized. And then you could start working on those traumatic uh, experiences. But I will say this, you know, he's 30 years old. Uh, these issues can be managed. They're very difficult to treat, but they can be treated. So there's always hope. You need to build a good system of support around the family, a good system of support around him, uh, and uh, you need to, you know, take it day by day, symptom by symptom. Uh, and there's a lot of variability from person to person. And, you know, and get second opinions. If a doctor says something, says, well, this is the way we're going to go. Uh, ask questions and get a second opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. This is your son and uh, you should be a good advocate for him. Wow, great. Um, this is so helpful. Uh, a few more on educational things. Did you say um, there's a website uh, that can help teachers dealing with issues of children experiencing PTSD from the pandemic? Oh, we're going to actually, uh, we don't, there is, a, there's some things on the Mental Health Gateway website right now, but we are going to actually, uh, this summer, we're, I mean, I'm sorry, this fall, we're actually partnering with community and schools, uh, and we're going to be offering uh, training online for, par for teachers and administrators, specifically on wow. mental health issues related to COVID-19. Uh, and that will be getting rolled out later this fall. And like I said, I'll get you all the contact information and, and stuff so like that. So helpful. 
Um, but again, uh, that uh, for those of you who are interested, that's uh, initially hopeandhealingcenter.org. And, and hopefully there'll be a trail in which you can get that. Kind right. Of if you go there and you sign up for our, um, for our monthly kind of updates and things like that, you'll certainly get a link when that comes. Oh, up. that'd be great. So that's hopeandhealingcenter.org. Um, can the, uh, another school question, can the cognition problems of PTSD, um, oh, I think I, I, I think I got that, wait, see, yeah, no, I know, I got that question. Um, three people asked this next one, or a variation of this next one, and you're going to have to help me define some of these things, because they're asking about your thoughts on eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, I guess known as EMDR. Right. And emotional freedom techniques, EMD, mm -hmm. uh, for treating PSD, PTSD. Are these treatments effective in your opinion? Three questions on that. Well, I, I will say this first. You don't care if, if they're effective in my opinion. You only care if they're effective in research. So what my opinion is ha needs to be based solely, and I will base my opinion all, only on what the research has been done. Uh, the uh, emotional freedom techniques, which is the tapping, the tapping that's done, there is zero, zero evidence uh, that that has any effect whatsoever. Now, I'm not going to tell you that there aren't going to be people that come to you that say that it didn't change their life, but that's anecdotal evidence. That doesn't mean that it really works or not. Uh, the EMDR, uh, there is evidence that it can be helpful. Uh, the eye movement aspect of EMDR has been demonstrated to have nothing to do with the effect of EMDR. Uh, and EMDR is not nearly as effective for trauma, uh, in fact, not even comparable to exposure therapy. Exposure therapy is the standard and most effective uh, therapy for uh, trauma. Uh, and it has been proven time and time again to be effective uh, in many, many random controlled trials. Uh, the, and so I, if I, what I would say is if you can get exposure therapy, First off, I would say this, you go to a therapist who has training and experience in trauma. They, they need, it's not just for any therapist. Number two, you, you ask them what therapeutic intervention they use. If they use exposure therapy, that's the best. If they use EMDR and you feel comfortable with that, that's okay. But you have to understand that it is simply not as effective uh, as exposure therapy. Uh, and the emotional freedom uh, stuff is just simply not effective uh, from a, a mental health perspective. Okay. And um, did you say earlier, another question, that PTSD can actually cause brain damage, meaning memory deficits? And yeah. if so, is it reversible? Yeah, the glucocorticoids that are released from our, um, like cortisol, which are released from our adrenal glands during these stress responses, they are actually neurotoxic. They actually, you can actually literally see that the neurons, they get thinner, they lose their branching, uh, they look very sickly. Uh, yes, they that brain damage can regenerate itself, uh, particularly if you're able to uh, stop this within a relatively short period of time. Now, you know, the real question would be, if it went on long enough, would you be able to regenerate enough back? And I, th I, I really don't know the answer to that. So as long as it's caught early enough and treatment is brought in, uh, then yes, the, the uh, brain damage can be regenerated. Okay, here's a combat veteran question. And we're going to tie this up in a, in a few minutes I, and give you a rest from all these questions. And you'll be back for another session of Q&A after the next lecture. But a combat veteran question. Uh, my husband is a combat veteran that faithfully served our country. He has PTSD. And I have to live with his anger and aggression towards me and the world. Uh, he doesn't think he has a problem. Rather, he believes that I and the world uh, are the problem. Uh, he doesn't feel like he needs counseling or help. What do I do? doctor? Yeah, that's a tough question. And obviously, if he has more anger and aggression towards you uh, subsequent to his combat ex exposure, then he, that in itself proves that he has a, he's struggling with a trauma issue. Uh, there is a higher rate of domestic violence in people with PTSD, combat veterans. Um, you know, I would say this, we unfortunately, we cannot control what other people do. Uh, but you can't control what you do. And so there's, there's two things that I think you need to do. Number one, you need to be in counseling or in a support group that is caring for you. So you need to make sure that you're in that, uh, that you've got support around you. You need to associate yourself with a faith community that's supportive of you uh, so that you are getting the care that you need to deal with this increased stress in your own life. Uh, number two, 
uh, if your husband is just refusing to go get any type of care, you have to set up appropriate boundaries. Uh, mm -hmm. You should not allow, you know, you cannot allow your husband to be physical with you or speak to you, uh, you know, profan with profanity or throwing things or things. You simply have to set up boundaries. If that occurs, you need to call the authorities. If that occurs, you need to leave the house. I mean, you, you have to set up safety boundaries for yourself. Uh, your husband is probably shamed by this experience. I mean, he served our country and, and, and he's a hero for that. And now he comes back and no one seems to understand what he went through and no one really does understand except other combat veterans. You know, my recommendation would, would be to talk to him about getting into a PTSD support group that has other combat veterans in it that's led by a combat veteran. A lot of times these guys are, are very open with one another, but they won't be open with others. Just start with that. You know, it's a, it's a group that... Uh, Will protect him. It's a group that he can talk about whatever he wants to talk about in there, and they won't say anything. So a PTSD group that's led by a combat veteran uh, that has combat veterans, and I think he'll appreciate that. So depending on what war he was in, uh, usually uh, guys that are in Vietnam or earlier, they don't want to be in groups that are mixed sex. They want single sex groups, males only, females only. Uh, sometimes the later guys that have been in the Gulf War or things like that, they're okay with uh, females being in the group. But talk to him about that. Would you be willing to go talk to some other combat vets? That's all I'm asking is that you just go to this combat vet group. Uh, just a very simple start. It's a lot for someone to ha come up and say to you, I think you have a mental health problem. You need to go see a psychiatrist. You know, that, that can really weigh on someone. But to go talk to his brothers, in a sense, uh, might be more open. Great. Okay, last three questions and then we'll wrap up this section. Uh, one is just a real quick one, you know, um, and uh, again, we have youth and adults that are with us, but I'm not sure who wrote this. Um, can scary movies cause PTSD? Uh, probably not. Uh, although I think it would depend on the age of the person and what they mm, actually saw, true. but uh, probably not. Usually with PTSD, you're thinking about a life and death kind of exposure. Okay. Well, many, many years ago, I remember I saw The Exorcist and that scared the heck out of me. <laughs> So, okay, um, another medical um, phrase, I don't know, uh, transcranial magnets, do they yeah. help depression? Yeah, transcranial magnetic stimulation is, uh, is kind of a newer FDA approved. And what happens is they put two very large magnets. It's a little thing that kind of folds. It, you know, it looks a lot like, a, a, if you've ever been to the dentist and he has that funny uh, light that's kind of a dome, it's kind of shaped like that. They kind of put it near your head and a magnetic field is generated. And that magnetic field then stimulates your cortex. You don't feel anything. You just sit there for about 45 minutes. You do it three or four times a week for a couple of weeks. It has been FDA approved for the treatment of depression. And for uh, some clients, it can be very, very effective. Okay, great. And then uh, the last question, and, and maybe I'll even close with prayer after this one, is how and when does spiritual healing and prayer come into the process of counseling and therapy? Well, I think spiritual healing and prayer are an integral part of uh, counseling and, uh, and therapy. I think that, uh, you know, as I said in that uh, lecture that, you know, God is the healer. I mean, how, how we get healed, that's up to him, you know, and whether we get healed is up to him. So I think that we always should pursue uh, spiritual healing. I think we should be praying for healing. I think we should pray against the demonic. I think uh, that we should be in the word. I think we should be fellowshipping with other Christians. But I also think that we should pers pursue those things in the natural that God has provided, such as counseling or medication. I mean, these are all things that come from him. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that we would be short-sighted to say, just go take some medicine, you know, or just go, just go pray uh, when God has provided all of these things. And I think we should uh, do all of them. So, I mean, we at the Hope and Healing Center, we pray for our clients. We pray with our clients. We pray for healing. I mean, God's called us to pray for healing uh, and we pray against the demonic, uh, but I wouldn't treat a mental health problem differently than any other physical health problem. I mean, I would do the same thing for someone who had cancer or a heart condition. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm kind of a, I, I think you got to just go with everything in a sense. I think God has provided us a lot of opportunities. I don't think anywhere in the scriptures, it says you pray and sit and wait, you know, and for healing, that's it. Don't do anything else. I mean, Luke was a physician. I mean, you know, Paul talks about medicine. I mean, medicine's talked about throughout the scriptures. I mean, there's, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for healing. And, and I think we just need to be cognizant and realize that it's all God. Yeah, and, and some of the local therapists who help uh, answer questions uh, the last two nights, you, you could see when I read their bios, they're willing to do both and, just as you Ooh. said, Matt, that 
they will pray with you if you want that. They'll do Lectio Divina if, you, if that would help you. And they're, they're willing to pray uh, for God's presence 